All right, so while I take care of all of this, I want to say that this is the first time that I'm coming to Puerto Rico, and that it's really a pleasure being here and escaping a bit of the winter. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a very short break. I arrived yesterday, I'm leaving tomorrow, but I can't tell you how uh, happy I am to be here. And as Lloyda mentioned, so I've been involved in this uh, teaching at Cold Spring Harbor, this summer proteomics course for a little while, for, since, for about eight years. And um, so last year I got to meet uh, Fredison, who's a student here. And uh, I was very happy in, uh, with meeting him, but also impressed with the, the efforts that I put here in developing this uh, translational proteomics center. And uh, I really enjoyed the talk that was given earlier and uh, learning about what you have here. So um, uh, even after this, if anyone needs uh, any of the protocols that we have developed, I'm really happy to share this. And I'm happy to send them to you and you can distribute them uh, in your institute and also make them available. It's not a problem. I'm really happy to do that. So um, as Loida mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Biology at Princeton University. And uh, my lab is really at this interface between proteomics and virology. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about what we do, but I'm also going to try to highlight some of the methodology we, that we have developed and put it in this context of proteomics being utilized as really a remarkable tool in terms of learning more about biology and maybe developing also novel therapeutics because I think this probably is really critical for having a translation of proteomic center as you uh, are having here. So the type of questions that we are addressing in my lab um, are quite simple but difficult to t but <laughs> challenging. So the first one is we try to understand how viral proteins can control cellular host processes. And this is easier said than done because viral pro viruses sometimes have very few genes and very few proteins. I think <laughs> HIV is a very good example for that. And nevertheless, with these very few proteins, they can take over really complicated and complex cellular pathways. So in a way, if I would give you 10 tools, 10 proteins, and ask you to design all these different methods to take over a, a cellular pathway, or many of them, it, it would take a while, right? And this is the beauty of evolution and the fact that viruses have co-evolved with their hosts and have these really intricate and elegant ways to um, to hijack certain cellular pathways. We can use this information. If we can understand this, we can use it. We can use it for manipulating that cellular pathway even outside the context of viral infection. We can use it to, to manipulate a, a pathway that can be invo involved in cancer or in another disease, right? So this is really important. Um, so we try to understand how do viruses do this and how viral proteins manipulate host cellular proteins. The other side of the story is, of course, uh, this is really uh, an interplay between the host and the virus. So th the host will adapt to an infection, will respond to an infection, will have a defense, um, many defense mechanism. And how do hosts defend th themselves against viruses? And can we find those important interactions that we can maybe manipulate to restore a defense mechanism in a host cell, in a human cell? And I'll tell you a little bit about that during my talk. And. Um, Connected from this is, of course, can we really identify using sort of proteomic techniques? Can we identify those host uh, cellular, those cellular proteins that are critical during viral infection, and maybe we can target them for therapeutic development? So. Um, <laughs> I just want to start, put this in perspective and tell you that we started looking at this um, process of viral infection um, using proteomics a few years ago, about 10 years ago, when we realized that there is really value in terms of merging and integrating different techniques and different disciplines and, and trying to get sort of a systems view in a way of, a system, of a, in the process of infection. So what you see here is a cell is going to be dark in the beginning and then as you say it becomes dark, uh, brighter. But is a cell infected with a virus um, called Symbis. So it's a little RNA uh, virus, positive strand RNA virus in humans tends to give arthritis. 
Um, but since then, we made many, many movies like this. But I think this illustrates exactly what I want to say, is that we can follow uh, the infection of a cell. We can make these viruses that have fluorescent tags. So in the context of the full length replication, contact, uh, replication competent virus, and infect host protein, uh, sorry, infect the cellular um, cells. And we can see where certain viral proteins localize, sorry. So if we take snapshots at different time points during infection, we can see when a viral protein starts to be expressed, if it has a dynamic localization, where it localizes. But then if we design proteomic approaches to try to isolate that viral proteins at different stages of the infection process, we can learn about how um, how viruses manipulate cellular processes. We can identify important virus-virus or virus-host protein interactions at these different time points of infection and say, okay, at this particular moment in time, at this time of infection, the virus requires this particular interactions in order to replicate and spread so efficiently. So what we effectively we are trying to gain is a temporal and spatial view of infection. But this is, of course, easier said than done, because for that to happen, you have to have a way to really kind of capture a moment in space and time. And this is something that still people work towards these days. And we just become better and better at it, but it still is not there. It's still a long way to go. So. We have spent um, several years um, in developing these methods that would allow us to capture a moment in time and isolate effectively proteins following infection and characterize the, these protein complexes that contain viral and host proteins. And the virus that I showed you initially, this little virus, is Symbis. But in my lab, we actually work uh, on three other viruses. We work on two DNA viruses, two herpes viruses, human cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex virus 1. And we also work on HIV. This we mainly use as a model when we first started to develop the tools. And um, since being at Princeton, we put a lot of effort in developing these methods to look at protein interactions. and. While these were developed to, with the goal of looking at virus-host interactions, we really could apply this to numerous other processes. We could learn, as you'll see, about how um, histone deacetylases work. We could also apply them in many other systems, in bacteria, in yeast. So, um, so these are some of the uh, papers that were either method development or applications of this method to other uh, systems. However, what we learn is that when utilized properly, proteomics can really help. And it can help in understanding virus-host interactions. And we mainly focus on this level of protein-protein interactions. But more recently, we also started developing tools and approaches that are really uniquely designed to look at protein RNA and protein DNA interactions. And we learn quite a bit. We also learn how little we know and how far we have to go in understanding infection. But we learn how viruses control stress response. We learn about how human cytomegalovirus controls cell growth and the mTOR pathway and maintains it active. Uh, we proposed a new model for the assembly of a virion so that it can infect neighboring cells. And we learn about innate immunity, this really important mechanism in defense against viruses, and about chromatin remodeling and how viruses manipulate these enzymes. And oh, great, thank you. This is what I needed. Perfect. So um, for the talk today, I, I tried to make a combination of um, several projects so that you will get a feel about how we take proteomic information. And you heard today how important it is when you have those results. What do you do with them and how do you interpret them? How do you design your experiments so you actually uh, understand biology from that? And I'm going to um, use the first part of the talk to talk to you about innate immunity and what we have learned about this. And then the second part of the talk, I'm going to uh, talk about chromatin remodeling enzymes and histone deacetylases. But I'll use that also as a um, 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 as a way to tell you about some of the methods that we have developed and see if you uh, would benefit from them in the lab. But one sort of light motive, one theme that came from all these studies and um, that we carried out has been the fact that acetylation, these post-translation modifications on protein, 
is really important during infection and is important from, in, from different angles. And uh, I think these the two sort of projects that I'll tell you about uh, will present this completely different perspective of why acetylation of proteins is such an important event during infection. So I'll start by telling you a bit about innate immunity. And um, so our cells, mammalian cells, human cells, have this ability of detecting the entry of a pathogenic DNA, like a viral DNA or a bacterial DNA. Once it enters, they have this ability of sensing this pathogenic DNA. And they do this um, by using these proteins in the cells called the, that we call DNA sensors. There are not too many known. Uh, so every time we identify or a, a DNA sensor is identified, that's a big deal. It's something very important that we can uh, study. And these DNA sensors can bind to the viral DNA and then they can trigger an innate immune response. So they can trigger pro-inflammatory cytokines, they trigger interferon response, this sort of defense mechanism that is really critical for uh, making a, def a protective environment in this cell, but also for um, letting the neighboring cells know about the, that the problem is happening here. And the protein that I will want to introduce you to is this interferon-inducible protein 16, this IFI 16, that just recently uh, turned out to be one of these new DNA sensors. And I'll tell you why it's so important and how we use proteomics to really characterize this process. And the work that I will tell you about is, uh, has been carried out by two graduate students in my lab, very talented, Tuo and Ben. So, what do we know about this protein, IFI-16? Well, it's thought to be predominantly nuclear. It's thought to be localized in the nucleus. But we became interested in this protein when we studied, uh, in our studies of isolating viral proteins and looking what the viral proteins actually target in the cell. And we found when we isolated uh, this pro viral protein called UL83 following infection with human cytomegalovirus, we found that this protein targets really specifically <laughs> IFI-16, interacts with it in the nucleus, and that IFI-16 can bind also to the viral DNA, to human cytomegalovirus DNA inside the nucleus. And we were also able at the time to show that this interaction is really relevant for the progression of infection. So we became very interested in this protein. A little bit later, another study came out from another group that I think was really beautiful, where they showed that a small subset of this protein can exist also in the cytoplasm. What was interested about, interesting in this is that when they transiently transfected small uh, viral DNA pieces from Vaccinia virus, so these are just DNA pieces, that IFI-16 could bind um, DNA, viral DNA, uh, double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm, and by doing this, it also interacted with an ER protein sting, and it triggered interferon response through this sort of TBK1-dependent pathway. So, so therefore, it established that IFI-16 has this role in triggering an interferon response following binding to this viral DNA. Just remember that this is not natural infection here. These were just transfection with small DNA pieces. So in a way, this is both exciting and expected because it's exciting because IFI-16 can be a, maybe a new sensor and it finds a new function for IFI-16 in the cytoplasm, but it's maybe a little bit expected because all the DNA sensors that have been identified so far are cytoplasmic for, from two reasons. One, well, when the virus enters a cell, this is where the virus first gets in contact with the host proteins and it was thought that this is where the DNA sensor should be. The other main problem is we still don't quite understand how, if, if it would be nuclear sensing, how could the host protein, how could the protein detect that the DNA is viral or host or human? How can it bind to one and trigger an interferon response or not the other one? So therefore all the all the sensing, all the DNA sensors were cytoplasmic and IFI-16 was here predicted as a possible DNA sensor that is again cytoplasmic. However, soon after that, um, another group kind of confirmed what we found uh, after human cytomegalovirus, but this time they showed it with Kaposi sarcoma associated virus. And they showed that following infection with this virus, IFI-16 can bind viral DNA in the nucleus, 
and therefore bind also to ACS and caspas one trigger the localization to the cytoplasm, and then trigger expression of interleukins. So trigger, trigger an inflammatory response, and again, a nuclear function, and IFI cysteine can bind actually to viral DNA in the nucleus. So these sort of all these knowledge and put together made us to uh, hypothesize that maybe IFI 16 is one of these very important proteins in our human cells that can <laughs> sense foreign DNA in a localization dependent manner. Um, so this would be important because it means that we have these proteins that are utilized to, to detect viral, patho viral DNA in different locations and maybe this is how it, you would also detect what type of viral, uh, virus it is or we can use the same tool to do several things. But th there are many questions remaining. First of all, uh, is IFI-16 really involved in DNA sensing in the nucleus? This would be the first time that uh, DNA sensing would be reported in the nucleus. And also, what are the molecular mechanisms that control this sort of change in localization between the nucleus and the cytoplasm? And so, to be able to look at this, we first had to build some tools to look at the IFI-16 either in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. So we had a look at the protein sequence and I think we heard this morning how important it is to actually do some preliminary work on a protein before doing any sort of proteomic analysis to know what you're dealing with and design your experiment properly. So we did the same thing. We looked at the sequence of IFI-16. So we know it has two domains called HIN200 that bind to this double-stranded DNA and it has a pyrene domain involved in protein-protein interactions. But what we were able to show is that it also has this region here that contains these arginine lysine rich moti motifs that mimic possible nuclear localization signal motifs. So we wanted to validate this and indeed when we synthesized, when we, when we generated this uh, IFI-16 tagged with green fluorescent protein either as a wild type the full length or lacking either this motif here or this motif here or these ones, we were able to show that these two motifs are indeed required for the localization of the protein to the nucleus, otherwise it stays in the cytoplasm, while these other two are just supportive. So we, having established that the, the nuclear localization signal of this protein, we could then use this to either target the protein to the cytoplasm or to the nucleus and study this process of sensing of pathogenic DNA in a localization dependent manner. So we could, we could express this, we did this in a tetracycline inducible manner so we can turn on or off the expression of this protein and we could target it to these lo subcellular locations. So to study the process of sensing in the nucleus, we infected these cells with herpes simplex virus 1. And I want to kind of tell you here, because this will make a lot of sense to you now, um, that when HSV1 infects a cell, the viral DNA is actually quite well protected in the cytoplasm. It's protected by capsid proteins that are around it. So it only becomes exposed in the nucleus. So it would make sense for us to actually have some proteins there that can still detect viral DNA in the nucleus as well. So we infected these cells with HSV1 and we looked at the ability of IFI-16 to bind to viral DNA. So we isolated IFI-16 by immunoaffinity purifications and we looked at binding to different regions, random regions, on the DNA of the HSV1. And we saw that the nuclear one, that wild type that I showed you earlier, the nuclear IFI-16 can bind really effectively to viral DNA. But the two uh, deletion motifs that were cytoplasmic could not bind to uh, viral DNA, right? So this again we confirmed also using fluorescence in situ hybridization where you can see here in green the localization of IFI-16 and in red the localization of viral DNA and you can see that these localize when with a nuclear IFI-16 but not with a cytoplasmic IFI-16. But this is just binding. What's important is also the interferon response. So did if IFI-16 binds viral DNA, does it actually interfere in any way with, or does it trigger an interferon response? And yes, it does trigger an interferon beta response. Um, the expression here of interferon beta, you can clearly see elevated at six hours for the wild type, but not, so for the nuclear IFI-16, but not the cytoplasmic one. So this clearly establishes that IFI-16 is a sensor that can work in the nucleus and is the first protein that we know of that can act as a nuclear DNA sensor. 
How about in the cytoplasm? Well, to do this, we took again HSV1, but this time we chopped it into small pieces and transfected these viral DNA pieces into both the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Um, and we looked at the ability of IFI16 to bind to this. And the wild type, the nuclear one, bound very well to this. So this is the same level as here. But these two motifs that were cytoplasmic bound even better, which you would expect because now if IFI16 is cytoplasmic, <laughs> it has the ability to bind to viral DNA pieces. This also tells us that those motifs are not the ones that are making or breaking the ability of IFI16 to bind to viral DNA. So what this, uh, and again, this was translated beautifully in terms of interferon beta expression. Um, so what this clearly illustrates is that IFI-16 senses this viral DNA in a localization dependent manner. But then we still don't know the mechanisms <coughs> that modulate its localization. So in order to, do, to look at the, these mechanisms, we turn to proteomics. So something that we have a lot of expertise with is isolating these proteins in the context of infection. As I told you, we have developed these approaches to isolate the protein by immunoaffinity purification and do a good job with an effective isolation and be able to characterize the isolated protein complexes. So we wanted to do this in uh, using and to isolate endogenous IFI16, since this is such an important protein, we did not want to overexpress it and have a possibility for an interferon induction already. So we use um, CMT cell ly lymphocytes and we froze the cells, we lysed them in a cryogenic manner, so by keeping them frozen and maintaining the protein complexes. And then we performed immuno affinity purification by combining two monoclonal antibodies against IFI16. We then um, either isolated this protein on, on a gel or we did in solution digestion. And we, our goal here was to look at post-translation and modifications that may actually regulate this localization of IFI16. And the reason we were interested in this, we were a little bit biased because from our work on, hum on histone deacetylases that I'll tell you a bit in a, uh, in a few minutes, we know that, for example, phosphorylation can be really important in targeting a protein to the nucleus or the cytoplasm. So we asked if there are similar post-translation modifications that can also regulate IFI16 localization. Something that you know, I recommend for you to do as well and you can do here is when you look at the protein, you can, look different, you can utilize different enzymes that, cleaves, that cleave at different points in order to um, kind of improve the sequence coverage, especially when looking at post-translation modifications. This is very important. You want to make sure that you cover as much and you see as much of a, uh, the sequence of a protein as possible. So by combining trypsin and glue C digestion and in other experiments, lysine C, but just from looking at those lysine arginine rich motifs, you will understand that you can't just use trypsin. Um, we could get almost 95% sequence, uh, percentage sequence coverage um, and identify post-translation modifications. In my lab for this experiment, we use an LTQ orbit trap, VLOS, but you could really do these experiments with the instrument that you have here with the LTQ XL just as easily, right? And we use different types of peptide fragmentation techniques to try to also look at longer peptides or shorter peptides. So what we found was quite uh, astounding was the fact that this protein is really heavily modified. Um, it has several uh, phosphorylations, but also numerous acetylations. And the phosphorylations are clustered between the pyrene domain and this domain that binds to DNA. But the acetylations are scattered throughout the sequence of the protein. What was really important for us and relevant in our context was that this region that contains the nuclear localization signal is really heavily modified. And two acetylations, one here and one here, they are present exactly in the two motifs that I told you are absolutely required for the localization of the protein uh, to the nucleus within their nuclear localization signals. So how do you analyze this? Well, I think with post-translation with post modifications, the way I look at them is, especially also with phosphorylation, some of them can be really important for structurally modifying a protein. Other, others can be important for interactions. Others can be important for localizations and so on. But some of them may be also random event or may be present 
constantly present without really impacting the protein function. From an evolutionary standpoint, if you think about it, if, if something happens uh, and it doesn't change, it doesn't change the protein function, there is no need for the system to create some, a stop of that event, right? So it's it's not easy to look at all these modifications and understand what the function is, and there could be many crosstalks between modifications. So. We kind of took this uh, the torus by the horns, as we said, horns, and uh, we uh, um, mutated each of these residues to either alanine or to uh, phosphomutants or acetyl mutants. And I'm going to skip through a lot of results in the interest of time and just get to the ones that were relevant. So the the point was that the phosphorylations did not impact the localization of IFI 16, but the acetylations did. And when we mutated this in um, um, to to acetyl mimics, we noticed that when so when the mutation mimicked the acetylation, the protein became cytoplasmic, and the same here, when it was mutated to um, as a to mimic acetylation process, it remained in the cytoplasm. The alanine mutants did not do that. So to further confirm that acetylation actually inhibits this localization to the nucleus, we made also a nuclear import assay in which we either synthesize the peptide that contains that motif one as unmodified or as modified with acetylation. And then we used the GST-GFP fusion protein and so the, checked for the ability of this little peptide to carry this fluorescent protein inside, the nucle inside nuclei. And when it was unmodified, the peptide was really effective at targeting this to the nucleus, but when it was acetylated, it could not. So the acetylation, the, the process of acetylation in this case, inhibits the nuclear import of this uh, of IFI 16. So it can act as this molecular toggle of cellular distribution. Um, and this again recapitulates beautifully in terms of the interferon response, the ability of this protein to t trigger an interferon response. When it is nuclear, it um, triggers an interferon response here in the presence of HSV1, but when it's transfected, the cytoplasmic ones and the, the acetyl mutant uh, target triggers an interferon response. So obviously acetylation also indirectly modulates the IFI-16 sensing ability through its ability to control protein localization. So now the next question is what enzymes are actually taking care of this acetylation? And uh, I'll tell you very quickly, I'll go through this quickly, so I want to move on, that Histone deacetylases seem to be the one that deacetylate this uh, protein and can, when inhibited, this pr the localization of the newly synthesized IFI cysteine gets cytoplasmic, but the sirtuins do not impact on this. And in terms of uh, the, the enzymes that place the acetyl group, we now um, gather information that P300 is the enzyme, the acetyl transferase that places the acetyl group on motif one. And we also confirmed this by mass spectrometry in vitro, but we also confirm it in cell culture. So to put this all in a, in a model, we now know that IFI-16 has this nuclear localization signal that allows the protein to be targeted to the nucleus, where it can bind to viral DNA, such as DNA from herpes viruses, like human cytomegalovirus and herpes simplex virus 1, and then trigger an interferon response, so trigger innate immune response. However, when the protein gets acetylated, um, it gets stuck in the cytoplasm and where it can also act as a DNA sensor, maybe for cytoplasmic DNA viruses such as pox viruses. And then this process is controlled partly by P300 that seems to acetylate this motif one and partly by histone deacetylases. But there are some interesting also proteomic concept and uh, questions here. So. In terms of an acetylation regulating the localization of a protein, this is not a well-established con context by any means, right? This is much better understood for phosphorylation. For acetylation, there are hardly any examples, maybe three or four. Um, but I, I would predict that probably as we'll go on in the few, next few years, we will find out that more and more proteins are um, uh, regulated by acetylation in terms of their localization. And um, Matthias Mann and Ingming Zhao, two different labs, have tried to look at how many proteins are acetylated in a cell. And we start to understand recently that many proteins are acetylated. It's just that the technology was not there and the focus was not there to look at this. And they looked in HeLa cells, and, but they isolated um, acetylated peptide and made a catalog of 
acetylations. Now, you have to understand that when you do these high throughput, large scale things, you're not going to be able to look at really low abundant proteins, and therefore all the modifications that I show you there were novel, or they were not reported before. However, when we look through their list of peptides, we found that many of them actually resembled nuclear localization signal motifs. They just haven't been reported for those particular proteins as being their nuclear localization signals. So I think as people will start to look into this and assess the function of acetylation, they will also come to the conclusion that localization is one of those uh, mechanisms controlled partly by acetylation. Um, so together, these results are important because it shows that a two-signal model can be used to uh, expand the range of surveillance that the, that the host can use against viruses. The same tool can be used to detect viruses in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. But then there is the other side of the story, as I told you in the beginning of my talk, how the viruses actually counteract this. The viruses have figured this, out this way before we have, right? So they know how to... It, counteract this uh, uh, innate immune response and can we actually use that to to bring back the immune response in infected cells. So Tuo in the lab has worked on human cytomegalovirus and found a protein that is important for blocking the pyrin domain of this um, um, of, of IFI-16 and he's looking into determining and characterizing the exact interaction so we can block this and restore the innate immunity and it works really well so far, it's still ongoing. Ben in the lab has worked on herpes simplex virus 1 and found out that ICP0 is involved in ubiquitinating this protein and targeting it immediately for degradation. So as soon as the cell gets infected, this protein that is a defense protein gets degraded, right? Um, so, her, so obviously viruses also have to all deal with this process, but they just evolve different mechanisms to do this. All right, so with that I, can, I finish this innate immune part and I'm gonna spend a bit of time to tell you about chromatin remodeling enzymes and why this is really an important part in uh, my lab. Um, and we put a lot of emphasis on this. So something that really stirred our interest was the fact that viruses that are very different from each other, such as these, seem to all target chromatin remodeling enzymes, such as histone deacetylases, histone acetyltransferases, methylases, demethylases. So this told us that viruses have these really elegant m methods to maybe modulate host gene expression and viral gene expression. Um, so we put a lot of effort in understanding these enzymes. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we have done to, uh, to understand them. So as I told you, we have developed these methods for uh, isolating um, host proteins from infected cells and looking at their interactions. But I want to also strip it, this back and tell you how much you can actually learn by doing a good job with understanding interactions and putting interactions within different complexes. And this, I think, is the easiest illustration. This histone deacetylase, HDAC1 and HDAC2, have many, many interactions. I'm showing here just a few of them. So every single spot here is a different protein that interacts with these. But when, let's say, when HDAC1 interacts with uh, these proteins, it forms this NERD complex. Here it forms syn 3 related complexes. All these complexes have different functions. So a protein hardly ever exerts just one function. It can it get utilized, and through these interactions, it can f have many different functions. So it's really important to understand how many complexes are there and what the protein is involved in, because once a virus targets a protein, which, which one of these complexes and which function is actually targeted? And this we found to be important. For example, in human cytomegalovirus, we found that the virus specifically targets through a protein called UL38. It targets this NERD complex containing HDAC1. And we know now that this is this HDAC1 part of the NERD complex is targeted by these viral proteins, and that this is really important for initiating the infection, right? So so once uh, so understanding what complexes what uh, complexes a uh, certain protein is part of is very important for understanding uh, infection. But I would almost claim, and this is again something that probably relevant here in terms of having this translation proteomics research, um, 
I, I would say that it's also important for drug development because let's say HTAC inhibitors are, are clinically relevant. They're used in patients against cancer and there is a great interest in understanding these small molecules that can inhibit HTACs and defining them better. But even if we have a very specific small molecule that can only target one protein, you do not inhibit just one function. You inhibit this function and this function and this function and so on. So this can really trigger lots of problems, downstream problems and uh, secondary effects, right? So if we would find a way to target the function, right, or something unique about that complex or structurally or something unique in HDAC1 when it's part of that complex, and if we could target the function rather than a protein, I think we would do better down the road in terms of therapeutic development. And this is something that I'm very interested in. Okay, so just to tell you a bit about how we actually make all those networks, so, so something that hopefully you can use in your labs. Uh, we start with cells and either we use, um, we isolate endogenous uh, proteins as I showed you earlier with IFI-16, or if we do not have enough high quality antibodies against those proteins, we then use uh, tags. We like fluorescent tags because then we can visualize them as well, but that's only if that tag doesn't interfere with the protein function and we always have to validate that so we put a lot of effort there. After that, we perform these immunoaffinity purifications. We love using magnetic beads for this because it's a surface binding, so it doesn't matter if it's your protein complex is small or large, you can isolate it, it doesn't get disrupted by a network. And then after that, we digest it in gel or in trypsin. Last time I uh, told you about trypsin and glucy here, for example, for this histone deacetylase, we use lysine N. And we separate it by liquid chromatography, we analyze it by mass spectrometry, different configurations. Again, you can use very well the LTQ uh, Excel that you have here. And then we um, um, analyze the information. And sometimes if you have the ability of using different peptide fragmentation techniques, it can really help you at looking at these different sites and uh, different peptide lengths. But once you, isolate, once you find all the list of proteins, Let's say you isolate the protein, you can find 200, 300 proteins. As I just showed you, a protein can be part of, in different subcellular compartments, can be part of many complexes. It may not surprise you when you grind or take the whole cell that it interacts also with about 300 or 400 proteins. It just makes it really difficult to interpret. So something that is really worth spending time in is validating and first of all, confirming the specificity of interactions. And there are several tools that can be used. And I would recommend, especially on a budget, to try to use some label-free quantification tools like SAINT, for example, was developed by Alexei Nesvinsky. It works really beautifully when you have enough replicate experiments. Another one that we use um, is invo involves metabolic labeling. So similar to a SILAC approach, so let's say here we would have our cells that express the EGFP tagged deacetylase in this case, but it could be any protein of your interest. And you grow this in light media, and then you grow wild type cells without any tag in heavy media. So you can replace an amino acid with a hemino amino acid. Then you can combine these cells, perform the lysis together, and then you perform the isolation via the tag. However, since the tag is only in one in your specific component, hopefully by mass spectrometry, everything that would be, have just a light component should be specifically from that particular cell. However, if proteins associate non-specifically during the lysis process and during the, the, the process of immunoaffinity purification on the beads, they will come from both of these cells. So let's say actin, vimentin, plankton, some abundant cytoskeletal proteins, they exist equally in these cells and you would usually see them as doublets. What this takes, so this is in a way a harsh, very stringent way to look for specificity, but what it controls it is once you isolate, you have a bead, you isolate a protein and you have a protein complex, in reality all these proteins that are part of your protein complex can act as new interacting sites with anything in your cell lysate, right? And whenever you have also a lysis buffer that has detergent, so you're going to have some level of denaturation there, so you're going to have heat, heat shock proteins proteins that are immediately binding to that. So all those proteins can 
act as binding sites for non-specific associations. So you do not have only non-specific binding to your bead or to the antibody, but you have also non-specific binding to your proteins of interest. And this is what it deals with. This approach deals with that fact. However, it has a caveat. If there are certain fast exchanging interactions, interactions that go on, go off, go on, go off, go on, that you probably would lose it as non-specific because it can go from either of these, right? So here I'm just showing you an example from another deacetylase that we studied in our lab. And here in the red you can see the light component and in the blue you can see the heavy component and we can see that this is specific because usually these would be otherwise kind of one-to-one -one there. Right, so these interactions with chromatin remodeling uh, complexes in this case uh, are specific. So the reason I'm showing you this are two in seven that I'm showing you here even in more depth. And this work was done by Todd and Yuan Chin, two postdocs in my lab. Don't worry, he's friendlier than this. <laughs> this is taken out of context. We went with the whole lab to have this funny po uh, photo taken as gangsters and uh, we just make fun of him and show it a bit out of context. Um, but yes, he's a friendly guy. <laughs> Very talented, both of them. So uh, the reason I'm showing you this sirtuin 7 is that what do you do if your protein is really uncharacterized? It's much easier to start to look at the protein that is un well understood. You isolate it, you find some interactions, and you know, well, those interactions are part of this complex and this complex, and you can understand, and much easier formulate some follow-up experiments. But in the sirtuin 7 case, before our publications, there were only four papers out there, hardly anything, none of them proteomics. So there was hardly anything understood. So when you isolate it, and as I showed you earlier, you use these sort of approaches to really filter through non-specific interactions and pull off only the specific ones, you can start to build these sort of networks. And you heard earlier today about how important it is to look at these large data sets that you obtain and make sense out of them. Something else that you can do and is very valuable and can be very informative is to look at something called NSAF values. Um, that is, are you going to talk about NSF? No. Okay, so it's normalized spectral abundance factors. It tells you how abundant the protein is in that um, analysis that you will get. How many spectra do you get for, for that particular protein? So what you see here in, co uh, in colors tells you the relative abundance of a certain protein within an isolated complex. And you can do something even more. You can take that value and normalize it by the uh, level of that protein within a cell. Let's say if a protein is really abundant in the cell, I come back to actin, and it's abundant in your isolation, you may not be that excited about it as if you would be, if something is a very small level, very low abundance protein in the cell, but really abundant in your, in your isolation. And you don't want to have to do this manually and look through hundreds of them. You would want to do this in an automatic fashion. And this is what I'm referring to here as this NSAF versus PAX versus uh, PAX values. And this is what is plotted here. So then you can understand, okay, this particular complex, in this case, this BWH complex that has uh, nuclear localization like this enzyme is in chromatin remodeling complex is very well enriched. These complexes are also really well uh, abundant, relatively abundant in the isolated protein. So you can understand a bit uh, better what you're looking at. I'm not going to go into detail in the interest of time and just tell you that this actually has been really relevant for us and we could find and characterize better the uh, role for sirtuin 7 in our DNA um, um, in gene transcription in pole one in protein synthesis and uh, regulation of pole one levels. Okay, um, we also recently uh, developed a method that really helps us to look at to distinguish stable versus transient interactions. And if someone is interested in this, they can talk to me later, and I can send them methods for all of these and and proper protocols. So coming back to <clears throat> this sort of networks, th these are the techniques that we use to look at networks. And how am I doing with time? Because I can wrap it up at any time. Uh, we start 10 minutes late, but okay. I think... So I'll use another five minutes? Five minutes. OK, good. So, so we use these sort of methods to put together these interaction networks and, under, and understand them. And uh, there are many deacetylases, by the way, in the cell. In our cells, we have 11 hu human histone deacetylases that we found to be really important during infection. And I want to point out that when you build these sort of networks, 
you're not only isolating for the protein and finding the interactions, but you're enriching for that certain protein and identifying the post-translation modifications on it, like you have seen in IFI 16 case. And this can be very informative. When, when all of this is put into the context of localization, and interactions, you can understand how a post-translation modification can actually regulate a certain interaction or can or play a role in, in a function of a protein. So I just am going to tell you that for these histone deacetylases, what we were able to show was that, um, so something that was already known is that these uh, histone deacetylases are really important enzymes in regulating transcription and are transcription repressors. So when they are in the nucleus, they interact with this other complex and core complex and they turn off transcription. I think the colors were changed from the PC for with the, to the MAC, but hopefully you can see them. So um, these proteins can get phosphorylated left and right of the nuclear localization signal, which allows for the 1433 proteins to bind to this and trigger the localization of this protein to the cytoplasm. What we were able to show what, was that this protein was much heavier, much more, oh, wow. Um, it was heavily modified and that one of those modifications is within the nuclear localization signal but this time that phosphorylation is actually required for targeting this protein to the nucleus and I'm gonna skip through this in the interest of time and I'll just get to the main point um, to tell you that this also can help you to understand better the function of these proteins during the progression of cell cycles. So something that has been known now for a little while is that these histone deacetylases seem to have um, modulated their enzymatic activity during cell cycle progression and that in mitosis the global level of acetylation seems to be reduced and that the deacetylation, the activity of these enzymes is reduced. But we do not understand yet what enzymes are regulated, how they are regulated and um, what contributes to this. This is really important in many processes. It's important in heart development, it's important during HIV infection, right? And I can tell you more about this. But what we found is that these enzymes are, um, have interesting localization during the progression of mitosis and they localize to the uh, spindle mid-zone and the mid-body in the, uh, in the cells during the late stages of mitosis and you can see here nicely one of these H tags localized at the mid-body uh, as the cells divide. What we were also able to show, and I'm going to skip through this and go to the main uh, slide. Um, all right, this one. Uh, what we were also able to show, as I told you, these H tags can interact with this N core complex and regulate transcription and repress transcription. This interaction is really important for their function. What we showed is that Aurora B a kinase that uh, it's necessary for progression through cytokinesin can phosphorylate all this class of HTACs, can phosphorylate HTAC 4, 5, and 9. Um, and they, we found the identified the exact sites that Aurora B phosphorylates these within the nuclear localization signal. But what's important is that that phosphorylation triggers the loss of the interaction with this transcription repressive uh, complex and also that phosphorylation sequesters the protein um, at the sp uh, spindle uh, mid-zone and at the mid-body, so here in this place. So what we think that happens is that as the cells divide, the H tags are recruited there in this phosphorylation gradient and they are kept there so that they don't interfere with the reforming nuclei and they don't put their transcription repressive functions on those. And um, I had to skip through a few things, but my point is that once you isolate a protein and you look at their, and you use that data to in look at uh, interactions, at post-translation modification, and you can already step back and put that in the context of where it was localized at that time point. You can, of course, arrest cells and look at different cell cycle points. All of these informations can feed back and inform you on the function and the, uh, of those modifications and of those interactions. So to finalize my talk, I started by telling you about these two important questions. How do viral proteins modulate cellular pathways and also how do hosts respond to viral infection? And I gave you just two examples from the many pro projects in the lab. And one was how host cells actually sense viral DNA and the fact that we identified this two signal model for detection of viral DNA both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm and that acetylation is really important for controlling that localization of sensors. 
Um, and I also showed you that histone deacetylases are targeted during viral infection. Um, and several viral proteins, that's their function to target these enzymes and modulate their functions. And I told you how we can study their interactions in the context of infection as well as outside the context of infection and understand how their uh, functions are regulated. Um, so one sort of line motive as I started was this process of acetylation during infection. Um, but I think for this crowd, uh, crowd, I don't have to convince you that proteomics is really an important tool. And understanding interaction, protein interactions, it's so relevant to biology. So yes, we can identify these key components that we can then target for therapeutic development. And we have done this quite successfully over the last few years. And uh, uh, if, if these methodologies are um, optimized properly and applied properly, then you can find out some beautiful biology from this. And I want to finish by thanking my lab. Um, and uh, the, we are not as many as here. We seem to take credit also for all the husbands of everybody and wives. But that's a common photo. So, but I want to thank my lab and uh, the funding. And I want to put kind of an advertisement there for two things in our uh, university at Princeton, that we have graduate student opportunities and I want you to kind of uh, suggest your uh, students to go for the PhD degree because it's really a lot of fun to, to find all these things out and understand nature better and uh, apply to Princeton and, uh, because I think it's a cool place. Uh, and also, we have an undergraduate. Uh, it's very, there. very easy. <laughs> I think you should actually apply. But, and uh, we also have an undergraduate uh, student summer program. And the whole purpose for this program is to actually help undergrads that may not have uh, the ability to do all the research that they want. So we specifically look for places that they don't have all the, ability, all the labs and all the facilities that other labs, other universities have. So please apply, uh, because we are um, quite positive about this. And thank you. Yeah.